Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Chief Master Sergeant Jen Cox with Fortify the Force. And uh, I just want to welcome you to today. I'm going to get started right away just because we have a lot of questions to get through. And I want to make sure we uh, allow our panel the time to, to uh, give us the answers that they're hoping to uh, have the time to give us. So I want to introduce you everyone to two, two of my favorite people. First, we have Chief of Family Advocacy, Lieutenant Colonel Park Hill. And we have Chief of Mental Health Operations, Lieutenant Colonel Meyer. Welcome to you both. Thanks for coming. Thanks yep. for having us. Yeah, we're excited to be here with you, Chief. So my first question for you really is, what do you do for the Air Force? And how do you see Fortify the Force fitting into what you do and helping you? Perfect. Yeah. Um, so I'm the Director of the Mental Health Clinic Operations and more the readiness side. Yes. Up at FRA, we're we're really focused on readiness. Um, and then I'm the consultant to the Surgeon General and all things psychiatry. So one of the specific specialties in the mental health clinic. And I've been in the Air Force for about 16 years. Um, and what I love about EFIT is it's opening up a dialogue. Um, as you can imagine, sometimes it's not easy for us to have a dialogue like this with everyone who's invested. So this has just opened up a fantastic platform to have some frank conversations that are really helpful. Yeah. yeah, and I'm uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alicia Parkhill. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by trade. I've been in the Air Force for 17 years and uh, have recently taken over the job as Chief of Family Advocacy. Uh, before that, I was um, the Chief of Mental Health Operations. And so um, okay. Lieutenant Colonel Meyer and I have been working closely together for the past uh, year and a half, um, dedicated to helping our teammates in the field execute their mission of taking care of the communities that they are uh, charged with serving. So uh, super excited to be here with you, Chief, uh, and the rest of the Fortify the Forest community. Um, it's been really fun getting to know you and your team as we've been collaborating on the mental health initiative, first encounter initiative. And um, as Lieutenant Colonel Meyer said, you know, helping get uh, the information out there to the community, um, making sure that folks have the facts, right? That's really important. So thanks for having us today. Absolutely. Bye. Yeah. So let's just jump right in. Um, how do you see us as a force normalizing seeking help? How do we do that? Chief, that's an awesome question. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about that one. So what has struck me is recently, at least in the last 10 years, folks don't seem to struggle with seeking help. They're very open and eager to seek help. And I think it's something that we've been teaching folks since they're in kindergarten, really go seek out someone to talk about your feelings about what's going on. I think part of the issue is that we haven't done a good job of explaining the spectrum of what seeking help looks like. And the best example I can come up with is no one really goes to the doc saying, I hope I have a meniscal tear and that I have to get surgery, right? That'd be really kind of odd to show up to your primary care doc and say, I, I really think I've got this diagnosis and I need this treatment. They show up saying, hey, I've got knee pain or what they really do is before they go to the doc, Right? They're like, oh, I'm feeling this on the gym. I'm feeling this when I'm PTing. I'm going to back off a little bit. I talk to a friend. They say I should do some squats, strengthen this. Like, they kind of lean on that continuum of care. And if that fails, then they present to the clinical community and say, you know, I've been doing my best to get this, you know, to get on top of this. And it's not working out. Is something else going on? And they're relieved when they're told nothing is going on. Right? Like, no one walks out of the doctor's office upset that they don't have cancer or meniscal tear, that they don't need surgery. And I just don't think we do a very good job of having that conversation in mental health. People seek care and sometimes the message is, well, you don't need to be here. Well, that can sound like your problem isn't real or we are discounting your distress. So I think if we did a better job of saying, stress is happening all the time, sometimes it motivates us, sometimes it gets in the way of us doing what we need to do and then connected care to the right level, right? So if you're all the way over here and it's getting in the way of you doing your job and getting in the way of your relationships, holy moly, come into the clinic, let's take care of you. But if you're on this side of the spectrum and you're looking for that combat edge, you're still able to do your job, maybe there's another place where we could connect you. And that way that help seeking doesn't feel wanting and it doesn't feel like it's a punishment either. Yeah, I think um, a big piece of, um, of normalizing help seeking is that we all have a personal responsibility in that, in taking care of ourselves and taking care of each other, right? It's not, uh, we don't wanna just jump right to the healthcare system. 
right? I really want us to get back to that place where that, that wingman culture is truly kind of what I grew up with. I'm an Air Force brat um, and the, the community that the Air Force has and what it provides for us is like no other organization, none, right? Like our counterparts that work in, um, say for civilian company X, doesn't have the type of support, right? They don't have forums like Fortify the Force who genuinely care about their well being, right? Civilian counterparts want you to come to work and go home, right? And produce. Uh, we generally care about that whole person. And, and I want us to get back to that of it's all of our responsibility to take care of each other, right? To take care of ourselves and then elevate it to the, to the healthcare industry as necessary. Um, but making sure we do all those other steps in between. Right. Yeah, for sure. You were talking about Lieutenant Colonel Meyer, you were talking about people being, you know, sometimes maybe not disappointed when they come to seek help and, and, and say the mental health technician says, you know, well, this isn't right for you, but perhaps some education or something like that. And I was wondering if you think it might be more about how we, how we portray that message, the customer service angle of this, where, um, you know, it's, it's like, okay, we know you came in for help. We want to give you the best help that we can possibly and give you. And in your situation, this is, this is perfectly appropriate for you. This is exactly what you need. You know, I, I wonder if maybe sometimes it's the customer service message that doesn't end up making it. So it's, um, so people leave feeling that they've been helped or supported. Yeah, for sure. Words really matter. And, you know, one of the programs that we're piloting right now is targeted care. And a huge part of that program has been finding the right words because we can't rely on the clinical reality, right? It, I could kind of bumble through, you don't have cancer and everyone would go, whew, good deal. But if I don't find the right words to explain, you know, the distress you're experiencing right now is serious. And I'm really glad you came in to get help. I think this agency would be best for you right now. If I don't word it that way so that it doesn't sound dismissive and it doesn't immediately come with a consequence just because you went to the clinic versus you went to the MFLAC, which was another thing we ironed out with targeted care of making sure that before you're even a patient, we get the opportunity to have a conversation with you about what would be the best place to take care of the, the issues that you're describing today. So putting all those in place is really what's, I think, going to result in a better experience for folks coming in who are, who are really just trying to figure out how do I get help for this? Like it's not their job to figure out what type of diagnosis they have or what's the best door to go through. That's our job. And if we yeah. can, like you said, use the right words to get them there, I think it's going to be a much better experience for everybody. You, you talked about targeted care. So I'd love to learn more about that. So I have a couple questions that I think might, might kind of bridge into that. What's the answer to the lack of quality mental health care availability? Is there a process in place to bridge the gaps and long wait times between initial contact and initial appointments? And what's the biggest obstacle that mental health care clinics are facing right now? Ooh, chief. Yeah, it's Bring a lot, all at Bring once. the gun. <laughs> yes, right. ma'am. Well, you know, the military health care system as a whole is full of highly trained uh, multidisciplinary teams, right? So. For instance, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Myers is a psychiatrist. I'm a social worker. We've got our psychology friends. We have nurse practitioners. We have nurses, and we have our behavioral health technicians. Um, we have a huge cadre of mental health professionals um, who who join the military, right? Either whether they're active duty or are GS or contractors, right? They join this organization uh, to take care of folks. But as many of us have heard, um, I know there's been lots of conversations about um, access and providers, but we have a national provider shortage, right? That's impacting every healthcare system um, in the world, frankly, but nationally, it's definitely impacting us. And the military healthcare system is no different. Uh, no different. So um, what's unique about the military healthcare system now is that we have the Defense Health Agency. The Defense Health Agency has uh, what they call authority, direction, and control of the military treatment facilities. So they manage uh, the healthcare delivery or provision of care um, across the globe now. And we here at AFMIRA, which is the Air Force Medical Readiness Agency, um, we are here collaborating with 
with DHA to, to provide those services. And one of the initiatives that our team has been able to get off the ground um, and has just wrapped up a pilot is called Targeted Care. And Targeted Care is, um, or was designed to ensure that we are getting uh, members to the appropriate care that they need. So they come into our clinics and they are triaged, right? And it's a conversation, just like you were talking about, of you know, making that connection, finding out who you are as a human being and what is this, the current needs that you are expressing. And based on the information that we get from the member, we then vector. So we vector, meaning we say, hey, based on what you're telling me at this moment, I believe um, MFLAC may be best, right? Or maybe the chaplains or, hey, the Air Min Military Family Readiness Centers have this um, resource that will get you those needs, right? So we assess based on the information we have, and then we vector to the appropriate care, um, regardless of what that resource is in that community. And we understand that every community has a, a different, um, you know, resources available. Uh, so some of the vectoring comes to the mental health clinic. And what happens with this is that, you know, currently, um, and probably for the last several months, if not longer, you know, individuals will come into mental health, they request an appointment, and maybe there's four weeks, if not longer, are waiting for that intake appointment. Right, so now that's four weeks of time that somebody's not getting support and services, right? And so that situation is essentially being untouched, right? Now with the vectoring, we are exponentially increasing that contact from us to the, the service that that person needs. So the, the wait times are significantly decreased, right? Sometimes we're able to and often get people into the appropriate resource the same day, if not next day, right? So now we've gone from make, call your mental health clinic, get an appointment within whatever their time frame may be, say, let's say four weeks for this example, right? Having no contact waiting to call a mental health clinic, identify that you don't need specialty mental health care at that moment and connect it to another helping agency that can provide you that care within days. Right, so really utilizing our whole community, right? Because like Lieutenant Colonel Meyer talked about, right, it's, it's that spectrum. And, and um, I believe the uh, General Brown talks about the continuum of resilience, right? So it's, it's mental health care is on one side of that, that spectrum and all of these other resources that we've been funding and supporting and encouraging people to utilize for years are, are in between, right? Mm -hmm. And so let's, let's take advantage of all of them and, and utilize them appropriately to get at the needs of the airmen, uh, but also decrease that wait time while we are significantly short staffed in the clinics. And so it's uh, definitely, you know, not the silver bullet by any means. It's a, it's a partial solution uh, while we continue to get after how do we uh, increase our staffing, right? Um, and to that point, uh, it's a zero sum game, right? So we have uh, a certain amount of authorizations and right now we're having trouble filling those. So if we want to increase those authorizations, that has to come from somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And which career field wants to give up their staffing, right. right? Nobody, like we all are struggling, right? We all want more manpower. And so that that challenge is, is, is there, right? And I'm, frank, I'm just thankful that there's really smart people out there that understand the manpower world because that's definitely not Alicia Park Hill, right? But um, it's a zero sum game, right? And so then you can, you know, the other options are contracts, right? Well, I can create a whole bunch of positions, but if there isn't the people to There's, fill them, right? what are we doing, right? And so I think we have to be honest with that, that there's a national shortage. We're trying to recruit and encourage people to join mental health, right? So I know some people like, you are incur, you know, it, doing it, their education so that they can join us in this fight, right? We appreciate it, um, but we need that that extra support because um, we just can't create them overnight, right? Yeah, you mentioned that you you're rolling out the targeted care program. How many bases have been able to participate in that so far? Yeah, so this was piloted at nine bases thus far, and we're currently working on an Air Force wide rollout mm -hmm. because the results were just so promising, right? We were able to get folks to the right level of care before they became a patient. If they did need to be a patient, if they did need to come into the clinic, 
We had more bandwidth for them. So it's got lots of great second and third order effects. So definitely excited to see that roll out and all the help it's gonna provide for the community. Yeah, right. so our, our teammate um, is uh, joined us, is watching and uh, you know, our team here at FMIRA is very small, um, but very mighty. We have seven people who are on the headquarters staff to take care of the mental health enterprise, right? So that in, in, it's ADAPT, mental health, family advocacy. Um, and so one of our teammates is uh, charged with, with the targeted care execution. And so uh, they just rolled out um, throughout Global Strike. And so he trained um, personally all of the, the teammates in uh, Global Strike uh, to be able to start rolling that out. And uh, wave one is happening. And so we're really excited to get this uh, to the installations, the pilot uh, went to various bases, right? So it was across MAGCOMS, it was OCONUS, you had your small, you had your large. So we were able to, to see, you know, what kind of uh, results we would get. And like Lieutenant Kohlmeyer said, it was, it was promising. Um, it's not creating a program, it's using our current existing resources effectively. And that's key. Yeah, right. and, I would, and finding the right words. Right. Mm -hmm. A big part of the training is how do you communicate these decisions that are happening so everyone is on board. Yeah. Right. Um, we had a lot of great questions roll in on the FIT forums. We also mm -hmm. have them rolling in now on the chat. So I just want to let everybody know that please keep keep them coming. We may have time afterwards where uh, Lieutenant Colonel Park Hill and Myers. Meyer can both uh, maybe do a question and answer on FIT or something like that, so we can make sure we get questions answered. Um, but I did want to ask a question for one of our four C members. We have some Garden Reserve who are wondering um, what's the future of the four C career field, and then besides that, they're also wondering if we can do anything to help our Garden Reserve members receive the same timely level of care that our active duty members receive, since it's such a di different situation. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Um, first off, our four Charlies, uh, which is our behavioral health technicians, huge fan. They're amazing. Um, what's really cool about our four Charlies is they are provider extenders, right? So they, they can do a lot um, in our clinics. And what we have been doing here at headquarters is really trying to get them being able to do more clinical work, which they have been trained to do, and they are so good at it. And so we're seeing um, the fruit of that uh, starting to happen more, getting our four Charlies um, in, in the fight with us uh, and away from those phones, right? Like we need them um, with us helping with clinical care. And, and our four Charlies in the Garden Reserve, it, it's a unique uh, situation uh, based on the organizational structure and the timeliness of it, right? Because there's not a civilian a true civilian uh, counterpart to our four Charlies, right? So uh, the behavioral health technicians in the, in the Air Force specifically are, are, are highly trained uh, clinically, right? And in the civilian sector, that just doesn't translate. And so um, I can guarantee you that our CFM, the four Charlie CFM, Chief Clemens, uh, and our Guard and Reserve counterparts are actively talking about this right now of, how do we utilize four Charlies in the guard and the reserve? And what is the long-term plan for that? So I can't get ahead of it. Um, I'm, honestly, I'm not in those talks. Um, I'm not, that is uh, definitely uh, not my uh, scope, but I can guarantee you, I know that those conversations are happening and uh, they're trying to figure it out. It's very complex. Um, and there's a lot of just different challenges because of uh, the total force structure that we're trying to navigate. Now, the piece for the guard and the reserves um, from a help-seeking perspective, right? So I think it's important to, to, to note that uh, those services are tied to the title that they serve in, right? So uh, we are all Title 10, meaning full-time active duty, right? And then there's Title 32 and Title 5. Pretty sure there's probably more titles that I'm just not um, totally versed in. Um, but those benefits are tied to what status that people are currently serving in. And so frankly, those are um, congressionally mandated. And so we are able to provide those services to folks in Title 10 in the NTF. And then when folks are in Title 32 and Title 5, um, what I would encourage our guard and our reserve folks to utilize is their director of psychological health. So if all of their units have a DPH, so Director of Psychological Health, who is most often a licensed clinical social worker, 
who is trained and capable of providing support to that member and then connecting them with resources. Then you also have your employee assistance program and then civilian healthcare, right? So there's other opportunities for our garden reserve to access healthcare. And again, it's tied to benefits that's tied to uh, your status. Um, I'm not an expert in this, um, but that is um, our understanding. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, we, we definitely want to make sure people are taken care of. Um, the, the mental health clinics in the, the MTFs, though, are charged with uh, taking care of folks in Title 10 status. Right. I think if there was one plea we could make is don't wait until you're activated to take yeah. care of something, right? Lean on your DPH, lean on your civilian health care system, lean on the other things that are available because it's, it's painful when we find out someone's been waiting to be activated before they seek help or so that they can seek help. I wouldn't want that for anybody. Yeah, and, and to that point, I guess this is kind of a squirrel moment, Chief, but you know, I, I wanna take a, a second to that of just encouraging folks to take care of themselves and putting priority first over career. Um, as a, you know, as a mental health provider, I have heard and seen um, throughout my career, I don't want to get care because I'm afraid it's going to impact my career. Well, for all of us, this is temporary, right? And we can be replaced in the military, but you can't be replaced in your family, right? right? And I, 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 I'm just very, I'm just very, very <laughs> I really would just want people to just to think about that for a second of where are we from a priority perspective and encourage folks to make sure that you're putting yourself first. Um, and again, it's not just coming to mental health clinic, right? It's making sure that we're exercising and we're eating well and we're just taking care of ourselves on that basic level, um, but not getting it twisted um, and putting our, our careers ahead of our well being. I've seen it personally um, not work out well and um, your career is temporary. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people do worry about that. We have the flyers who are worried about losing their flying status, the security forces worrying about being able to arm and that, those kinds of things. So but we know that stigma is out there that, that you know, if I seek mental help, um, I might lose my ability to do my job. Um, since we're kind of on that subject anyway, let's talk about the MSD. Um, do you feel like the standards for deployment and PCS and being fit for duty are, are clear and transparent? How do we help patients feel the same about the MSD? And what's the purpose of the new MSD that just came out? And did it bring more strict guidelines for profiles, deployments, and return to duty determinations, do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. So the medical standards directory, the MSD, isn't a policy document. It congregates or amalgamates a lot of different policy documents. And at the end of the day, it's created for providers so that we're not trying to look up 13 different policies to see if you can deploy here or go there and it's all in one place. And it covers every diagnosis, right? It's not just limited to mental health. It covers all of your um, musculoskeletal diagnoses, your GI diagnoses, your neurology diagnoses. Um, so is it clear? Yes. That was the primary effort we made over the past year was to take this thing that used to be 43 different standards with seven little tiny footnotes and many of the standards weren't um, internally consistent. So you could end up in a little cycle of one thing applying to the next so that it was really clear, not only for our providers to understand how to navigate these standards, but also for our patients. So that was our, our, our key goal was not to change policy but to explain policy in a way that made sense to everybody. And if anything, it's kind of an extension of targeted care, right? So if you're presenting to the clinic and targeted care is gonna vector you before you're even a patient, well, once you come into the clinic, the new MSD does the exact same thing. You have these symptoms. Okay, well, symptoms aren't enough to get a diagnosis, right? If I'm studying for an exam, I might feel really tired. I might be distractible. I'm not eating very much. That's because it's a really hard exam. And as soon as I take that exam, I'm gonna feel better. Well, that, that's not a diagnosis. You're having human symptoms in response to a stressor. But if all those symptoms get in the way of you studying for your exam, oh man, we've got to do something about that. So the new MSD really delineates 
are you having dysfunction? Is this getting in the way of you doing your job? Is this getting in the way of you running your life? If it is, well, then we're going to do something clinical about it. We're going to either contemplate starting a medication, starting psychotherapy. And a, and a big thing for people to know about psychotherapy is it's not a conversation with a friend, right? We're going to confront you on some of your negative thinking patterns. We're going to explore, is this the way you treat other people? Is that part of the issue? And that in of itself can be pretty upsetting. We're not going to do psychotherapy for someone who doesn't necessarily need it. We might do supportive work or problem-focused therapy. So you can see how it's differentiating folks based on the spectrum of illness. We're aligning care with their actual diagnosis. Okay. And that, I think, has been really clarifying for a lot of folks, because if, if we can do that, if we can say your situation is getting in the way of you doing your job, you can't concentrate on the flight line, and you can't remember if you torque those last bolts to the right torque. Well, that indicates something is going on and we should do something clinically about it, but it also indicates maybe you shouldn't be on the flight line. And that conversation becomes so much simpler when instead of saying like, well, you came into clinic because you, you're frustrated with your boss. You were airman of the quarter last quarter and you're killing it, firewall fives, but you can't deploy now. Well, how does that make any sense? So for vectoring folks away from the clinic if they don't need to come into the clinic, and then once we decide they do need to come into the clinic, is this a disorder? Is this something that is getting in the way of you doing your job versus this is someone who needs some support and it, there's nothing getting in the way of their job? Then all of a sudden that profile makes a lot of sense. The other thing that we did with the profiling system is make it really clear that the goal is get them back to duty. So this is another one of those things where, you know, I don't know what textbook it's in or what rumor mill it started in, but a lot of folks think that mental health is forever. Even PTSD has a cure rate. You will hear people say, oh, you can't cure PTSD. You bet you can cure PTSD. MDD has a cure rate, major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder. All of these disorders are not forever. Medications will help decrease the symptoms. Talk therapy will resolve the etiology, the source of the disorder. And then you're cured. You don't need us anymore. We taught you how to fish. You can navigate the next anxiety situation even better than before. You don't need to be on a profile. So that profile to keep you here so we can finish treatment isn't a punishment. It's so that we can keep you and the mission safe, finish treatment and get you back out there. Now there are situations where, you know, if you have had dysfunction, you have not been able to do your job despite our best efforts and your best efforts, we haven't been able to get you back to the flight line for a full year. That triggers an evaluation. And that's another thing that frequently gets confused. Like, we use a lot of acronyms in the Air Force, and that's great. It makes our sentences shorter, but sometimes it, it undermines the clarity of our speech. It triggers an evaluation. Is this person going to get better? It doesn't trigger a decision. No one at one year is saying, oh, get them out of here. They're saying, will they get better or not? And a lot of times what we're doing is writing really long defenses of, you bet they're going to get better. They were getting a whole lot better, and then a kid got sick, or they were getting a whole lot better, and something changed in their family. Now that we've got that figured out, we can get them back on track. Mm -hmm. If they're not going to get better, then the decision process will move forward. But that's what that one year mark means. It means, okay, it's time to really take a look, mm -hmm. give this person, you know, our full effort view, what, show me everything that's happened. What is the future of this case? Mm -hmm. uh, which I can tell you in the civilian world, they don't do that, right? Insurance companies don't do that. They're like, wow, well, you cost a lot of money. You shouldn't be on this policy anymore. Decision. So these are the words, like we talked about earlier, words matter. If I could explain to folks that after one year, we're not kicking you out, we're taking a look, just that difference. And that our goal in the mental health clinic is to get you back to the fight. Boy, I feel like a lot of people would understand what we're all about and it might make it easier to understand what they're all about. I wish we could do more of that, hear that message more, because you do, it's often that we do hear the opposite message, you know, people having that one experience with a friend who's, you know, was kicked out after taking medication for a certain amount of time or seeing mental health for a certain amount of time, and then people take it as gospel and expect that that's the way it is when that's not in fact the case. So I appreciate you talking about that. I think that clears up a lot. Um, I do wanna talk about the same kind of conversation, the readiness conversation that we were talking just a little bit ago about the customer service aspect. And I think re the readiness conversation is one aspect where, where we could do better. I've had several of my own people go in 
and have had the talk in that initial appointment where, you know, if you're, if you're on medication for a certain number of days, I'll have to put you on a profile. If, if you seek mental health treatment for a certain amount of time, you know, there's a chance you could be boarded, those kinds of things. So I feel like that conversation could be done in a better way because I know for a fact that the people I've talked to have, um, have been dissuaded from further seeking mental health. They've, they've considered just quitting right there and deciding not to take the medication that was prescribed to them because they were so afraid what it would do to their career, their ability to TDY, their ability to, to PCS, those kinds of things that it, it just, it just really threw them for a loop. And I think I, that initial contact is so important, that trust that you need with your therapist to know that they're, you know, there for you and fighting for you and not just looking to put you up for a board. I think it's important. Well, how can we do better with that? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. And that is that is exactly what we're all about. And that is why we updated the MSD because the MSD is a great place where we combine all these standards and policies, right? But just because you put everything on one page doesn't make an educational tool. So we've actually built out a huge website with videos and posters and handouts to help our providers understand this as well, because it is confusing, right? Sometimes we fantasize about being primary care docs. We're like, we don't have, your lab value is negative, so you don't have this diagnosis so you can deploy. That sounds like an amazing world to live in, where I can just go one, two, three, and everyone's on the same page, where we have to say, that oh, sounds like you've really been struggling. You're saying you got all these symptoms, but it also looks like when I ask you about how things are going at work, you're doing really, really well. Like, help me understand that gray zone. So the, the world of mental health and making a diagnosis in mental health is really challenging, right? Provider or patients, maybe they don't trust us yet. So they're not telling us about their suicidal thoughts or their morbid thoughts. They're not telling us about how difficult things are at home with the spouse because they really just want to talk about how difficult things are on the flight line. Labs and rads don't suffer from that. So we know that the clinical part is complicated. If we can make the readiness and the standards part as clear as possible, then maybe we won't trip over them as we're having those critical first conversations. And I think all of the, I keep making this gesture, it probably just looks like an alligator at home, I apologize. If we can, if we can vector folks early, right? So one of the things we're working on right now is if we train everyone in the Air Force and SABC, Right? If we expect everybody to put gauze on, put a splint on and do chest compressions, should we formally train everyone in psychological first aid or stress first aid? That becomes the first vectoring moment, right? I'm noticing I'm having a lot of symptoms and my training in stress first aid tells me that these are starting to eke into unhealthy. What could I do about that? Or I'm noticing my airmen is starting to change their behavior. They're not showing up to PT. They're not hitting PT like they used to. I have tools to handle that now. You show up to the clinic, targeted care vectors you to an MFLAC before you come into the clinic. You come into the clinic, we look, is this impacting your ability to do your job? If it's not, why do we put you on a profile? We can take care of that. If it is, well, you really should be on a profile because it's impacting your ability to do your job and we're gonna get you better so it's not. Putting all those steps in order makes each individual conversation so much easier. Yeah, and to that point, you know, I think the conversations that you mentioned are are other humans trying to have that conversation of of transparency of hey, the system that we that we all work in, right, has expectations and these are are things that the system is going to kind of put put us in, right? The profiles, the MEB, right? What we've tried to do is with that MSD is just make it so much more transparent where you don't need a medic to translate for you, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, I, I really appreciate um, Fortify the Force working with us on trying to help um, put that information out there, right? So that you as a consumer are, are properly informed of what is going to occur when you come to the healthcare, into your healthcare experience, right? And then, you know, with that transparency of the MSC, I hope that folks are able to decipher it a bit easier because I can tell you a year ago, the last version, to me as a provider, I felt like I needed a decoder ring to even figure it out. And if it was confusing for me, like I knew it was confusing for my patients, 
So that was the first step, right, of getting that transparency to you as the consumer. And then now trying to train, you know, our 2000 plus mental health community, which as you can imagine, is, is a whole undertaking in itself, right, of, of trying to one, create that product that can train them and then helping them have time to execute that training as well. And then the third piece, I think, is really to educate the community, right? And that's what, you know, hopefully today is part one of that, of trying to make sure that our message, the truth, right, of what policy is actually saying is getting to every airman, not just those that happen to have access, right, to a provider or a friend who works in the clinic, right? Um, that can actually just research it themselves and, and make an informed decision of, is this choice of going to the clinic the right choice for me? Or do I need to see something else, which is fine as well, right? Yeah. We just want to make sure people get the, the, to the proper location that can provide them the service that they actually need. Yeah, you guys are crushing the questions. I might... <laughs> might slide in a couple extra just if you don't mind yeah, do you're doing so well um yeah. we have a lot of people who say that they can't get appointments within two weeks a month or so do you have any advice for them um on what to do um when when they're facing that kind of hurdle with mental getting help with mental health yeah, there's so there's a ton of stuff on the system side of the house that we are actively working on and the DHA is working on. Um, but if I'm giving the folks on this call tools that they could use, I'd start with don't wait. So mm. a lot of folks, and this is common in everything, right? Like, oh, I think I have a sore throat. I'm not going to do a thing about it. And, I, and all of a sudden, like, I can't think and I can't talk anymore. Now I finally go to the doc. Same idea. Don't wait until the last minute. Don't wait until it's spilling it over into your life before going to ask for help. And then once you've decided to ask for help, think about all the resources available to you, right? Have you reached out to your airman? Have you reached out to your command, your first shirt? Have you reached out to the chaplain? If you come, this is another reason I really like targeted care. If you come to targeted care, we're gonna be able to vector you to a support agency, maybe not the clinic right away. And if things get better while you're with that support agency, right? If you show up and symptoms are here, and you're working with an MFLAC and the symptoms keep going up, that MFLAC is gonna say, you know, I think it's time to refer you back to the clinic, this is more than just MFLAC work. This is more than just supportive work or problem-focused work. You need to go to that higher level care. Well, that MFLAC isn't gonna just drop you while you wait to get to the higher level. So though, that's a little bit of a spillover to how we're changing things on the system side, but if, if folks are wondering what they can do, that's where I'd start. Yeah, and I, I think, again, it's, you know, we understand that the the wait times, we get it and our, our I can't say it enough, our teammates in the field are trying the best they can with what they've got, right? And so they're managing all the patients and all the other requirements that they have um, with, with minimal manning at this point, right? And so how do we um, just take advantage of all the resources that, that are in the community on and off the base, right? And so um, is that military one source? Is that uh, the MFLAC? Is that what we now call PCBH, your primary care behavioral health, uh, which is mental health folks in primary care, is that give an hour, which is an agency uh, where mental health folks in the, in the local community volunteer their time to veterans, right? There's a bunch of resources that we just need to tap into. But at the end of the day, the system, right, is, is working on filling those positions with with dedicated folks to provide the care in the in the interim, uh, we have to be creative and mm -hmm. take advantage of all of the resources that are available to us. Right. It's part of targeted care. Is it also say you can't get somebody in for individual counseling right away? Can they be vectored into group counseling until mm -hmm. there's an opening? And uh, what would you say to people who are a little bit more uncomfortable with group counseling as opposed to individual? Okay. Well, so groups are a huge part of targeted mm -hmm. care. And it's, so I love groups because we're not trying to get you better in a room one-on-one -on -one with a mental health specialist. We're trying to get you better for the real world. So I frequently, when I'm starting a group, I comment on that. Like if you're struggling with being in this group, I want you to think about why. 
Because my guess is you're going to go to the commissary, you're going to go to the BX, you're going to be in a meeting with a bunch of other staff, and you're going to feel uncomfortable there as well. Let's unpack that, right? So if the mental health clinic is a little mini laboratory where we get you better for the real world, groups are a great step in that direction. And for the vast majority of folks who have a specific problem, I'm anxious in this situation, I can't sleep, I'm struggling with communicating with my boss or my colleagues, groups are really helpful for tackling those types of problems. And, and the way we use groups is really to provide skills, right? They're skill-based. Um, and so, you know, a lot of folks think that we're going to bring you into a room and now, you know, I want to talk about your mom and your dad, right? Or I want to talk about, you know, your trauma. It's not, that's not how the group dynamics go. Now there are groups that are trauma focused, right? But the, the majority of our groups are really skill-based, right? When we are trying to help folks with very specific um, needs, right? So if it's anxiety, right? Then this is a cognitive behavioral group where we're gonna teach you skills of how to manage that anxiety. We don't have to go into you know, that personal trigger, if you will, but let's get you the education, right? To combat the challenges that you're navigating. Um, and it's a great way. We, it's, yeah. it's just so rewarding to see when you actually get in that group environment, mm -hmm. the group dynamics are sometimes more powerful than the yeah. skills that we teach you, right? And so I think it's really important to, to not dismiss that group dynamic because um, one, it gets you into the treatment that you need early uh, and quicker. Right, but it also provides you a support group, essentially, and new contacts who are dealing with the same stuff that you're dealing with in a safe environment where we can process it together. And again, you have the ability to, to say as much as you want, but I can tell you with any therapeutic environment, you get out of it what you put into it, right? So just going and, and just being a fly on the wall um, isn't going to produce the same type of results as someone who's actively engaging and having conversations in that group. So um, don't knock it till you try it. It's mm -hmm. pretty It's pretty awesome. Yeah, I have to say from a personal experience, I, I felt the same way as most people do when they're going into group that it wasn't gonna be the right thing. But as soon as I got in there, I could feel the shift and and how I felt about it. And, and the support that I felt from a group setting has just been so tremendous. The, you know, the bonds you make and the fact that somebody else understands what you're going through and is going to say, I understand because I've gone through the same thing. I mean, you can't get that same relationship with an individual therapist. Um, and so it can be really powerful. I've, I've seen some really powerful things happen. So uh, yeah, I'm all for group counseling. So I'm glad that's part of targeted care. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, you know, and to that point, Chief, right? Like, so I think when you're going through stuff, it can be so isolating. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So isolation is is damaging, right? And it can it can be very counterproductive to our wellness. And so, you know, I'm a widow. And so I, um, the past four years have been dealing with grief and with trauma. And I have found like such strength through a widow's group, right? Where it's fellow widows who, you know, no one else can understand what I'm going through other than that group of ladies. And I can tell you that um, there's days that I wouldn't put my pants on, right? Like I wouldn't be able to get up if it weren't for them. And so I just really encourage people Right, that there is there is power um, when we unite together um, in that common kind of stance, right? And so, um, again, like I said, it, and you said it, it's goodness. Um, we just gotta give it a give it a shot. Yep, yep. Um, so we talked mostly about client issues so far, but I'd like to shift the conversation and talk about our mental health providers. Mm -hmm. With the shortage of mental health providers across the nation, what are we doing to prevent burnout for our providers? How are we working on growing our own providers? And what kind of incentives are we providing to retain quality mental health care providers? Um, I have a follow on to that, but I'll stop there for a second. Okay. <laughs> um, as I mentioned in my introduction, um, last year I was the chief of mental health operations and um, in a very uh, confusing policy environment that we are currently in, I looked at my 
kind of oh. job was like right. what what is my what is my job right and how am I going to be able to make change and I my first kind of focus was taking care of our people um I I have been so moved by the work that our teams do in the field. And when we got here and we found out that we had this opportunity to maybe just provide some love and some, some support to them, we really tried to run with that. And a lot of it was just trying to communicate with them, right? What are we doing on headquarters, right? What are we trying to get after? What are the crazy makers in the field from a policy environment? Really opening that, that line of communication and how are we training them? And so we all know that um, it, it feels good when you're feeling capable and competent to execute your job. And so really trying to make sure that we're training and informing and educating. And last April, we had our mental health flight leadership conference where we brought all of the mental health flight commanders and flight chiefs together and we just focused on training. And during that training, uh, we discussed burnout. And so you know, burnout is a um, is it occupationally driven phenomenon, right? It's re in 2019, the World Health Organization identified it as a, a disorder, if you will. So burnout, though, uh, we talk about burnout a lot, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm burnt out on the Netflix shows. I'm burnt out on Wendy's Frosties. I'm burnt out on whatever, right? Like we use it so flippantly. And so I really want to encourage folks when we talk about burnout that we really hone in and we identify what we are truly talking about. And burnout is tied to occupational factors, right? And as I mentioned, we're in a very confusing policy environment sometimes with you know transition and just all of the demands that all of us are under, right? And this is true probably for all career fields. But for me, I really wanted to focus on our mental health teams. And so we, we got this information, we started talking about burnout. And then I had the opportunity to brief our Air Force Medical Service senior leaders on, hey, our mental health community is, is hurting, right? And if we think about what your mental health community has been doing for the past 20 years, at least, they've been holding on to everyone's deepest, darkest, hardest, most vulnerable times, right? And that's a heavy burden to carry. And so as you can imagine, that gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And so um, really wanting to make sure that we're taking care of them. And so there's a, a focus in the Air Force Medical Service, um, just a focus on wellness and what are we doing to take care of our mental health providers. And I can tell you, there's not a day that goes by that, that we up here are not trying to figure out, as we say, how to make the clinic suck less, right? Like these folks came to join the Air Force to take care of people and provide care. And I want them to enjoy that. I want folks to enjoy coming to work. And so really trying to love on them and make sure that they know that one, they're appreciated and that they are equipped to properly execute their job. Um, that's what we feel like our job up here is. And so there is a large focus on that um, from the headquarters perspective. And then I know that our mental health leadership at the flight level is doing their best to take care of each other, right? To take care of their airmen and their providers so that they can provide that quality care um, every day to each of you. So um, it, it's not something that we take lightly for sure. And it's something that we have to do every day um, is to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves so that we can take care of you. Yeah, you nail on the head. Um, I'll ask, have, have we considered <coughs> leveraging things like telehealth, the crisis text lines and uh, mental health first aid skills uh, mm -hmm. training in order to help kind of relieve some of that burden? Yeah, so to the um, mental health first aid skills. So there's lots of tools out there. I'm a big fan of psychological first aid and stress first aid. Stress first aid responds to stress all the time. So that'd be helpful day to day while we're in garrison, but it also helps in a deployed environment because as we all know, although the media doesn't know, part of the, the worst part of deployment could be when you're bored, when you're waiting for the next thing to happen. And that's actually when stress can really rise. So stress first aid is really good for that. And then psychological first aid is actually a trauma response. And since we're not constantly responding to trauma, I wouldn't pick that as our primary modality but it's great for when traumas do occur. So that combination of kind of first aid skills 
would be fantastic. And we're looking at that at every level. Is that something that every single airman should be trained in? Is it something we should be training at BMT? Is it part of our medic X, right? So if you're going to have TCCC skills, should you also have psychological first aid skills? Um, so those, those platforms are fantastic. From a telehealth perspective, telehealth is funny because it's just a tool, right? Like in order to get online and talk to somebody, you still need somebody on the other side of that phone right. line. So if we don't have people in the clinic, where are we getting them to be online to answer the phone? We know that if we just farm it out to civilian telehealth programs, they frequently miss stuff because there's other driving forces in the civilian healthcare world, right? It, there's no consequence to me in the civilian world of over-diagnosing you, right? I can call you bipolar because you're a little irritable. It's going to bill better. I can start you on a lot of medications because you're, you're feeling good because I'm starting you on something that's validating, but those medications stop your career and that diagnosis stops your career. So we're not super keen on just opening up the floodgates to let everybody call anyone off base because that's going to have a lot, a lot of consequences to folks. Um, but what we are seeing is as DHA is rolling out its virtual medical center, we're getting a lot more flexibility, right? So if there's a clinic that isn't overwhelmed and there's a base that doesn't have quite as big of a clinic or the ops tempo increases at that base, instead of doing a manning assist and trying to get funding and sending someone away from their family to go support that other base, we can just pivot to telehealth and support that other base for that period of time. So I'm seeing a lot of flexibility with it. Um, and then I am excited about the virtual medicine as it continues to mature, because there are models where, you know, you've got an active duty provider at your base who understands your mission, who's PRAP trained. Mm -hmm. We do the vectoring. We make the diagnosis. We say, okay, based on this diagnosis, you need this evidence-based psychotherapy. You go do that psychotherapy online. You finish that, you're cured, you come back, we do the case closure, we take you off profile, we make sure everything is on the up and up, and you, you move back to being outside the clinic, if you will. I think a model like that has a lot of promise. Uh, we're just not there yet from a, a maturity perspective, because telehealth is, is in its teenage years. <laughs> Well, we're almost out of time. I want to give you both uh, an opportunity to have some final comments, if you'd like. I just want to say how much I appreciate you being with us today, your honesty and your willingness to, you know, kind of kind of face the fire a little bit <laughs> and uh, and and just, you know, you instill faith in the system in me. And I just want to thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, I'm grateful to know both of you. And um, for everyone else who's on the line after the Lieutenant Colonels have to leave for their meetings, um, I'll stick around. And if you guys have any questions or comments you wanna make afterwards, I'm happy to talk, but thank you. Um, if you want closing remarks, please. Sir. Oh, well, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> um, one, it's always great to get to know this cat better. Mm -hmm. I am so honored to be working with the folks up here. Everyone up here at AFMR is just so focused on getting people back to health. Right, like that's what gets us up in the morning is how are we gonna get people back to health today? Um, I could see the questions as they're rolling into the top of the screen. I love the tenor of those questions. I love the curiosity. I, I would be ecstatic if those questions showed up at the clinic. Um, Cause those are questions about how do we get better? How do we take care of each other? How do we take care of ourselves? Those are questions we can get after. Um, and then just the last thing is transparency is freeing. Right, like I hate policies that hide the truth. That drives me up the wall. So, you know, everything that we're building right now is color coded, is written so that everyone is on the same page because if you're starting treatment, you should know what you're getting yourself into. So we're setting our providers up for success with that language and um, I, I would challenge you all to do the same. Just ask those questions as clear as you can and, and share with your providers what's going on in your life as clearly as you can. We want to get to the heart of the problem with you. Yeah. Um, so, Chief, thanks so much. Thanks for being a partner with us and um, really looking forward to continuing our, our work together, not just on the Mental Health First Initiative or First Encounter Initiative, but I think there's more that we can do here. And I, I hope that uh, your team will uh, let us be a part of it. Um, we love just being at the table with you. Um, as he mentioned, I, the Air Force Medical Readiness Agency mental health team, um, all seven of us, um, are just so grateful to, one, be able to put this uniform on every day, and two, to be able to be in the service of, of you all. 
And I can tell you without a doubt that your teammates at your installations feel the same. They're just struggling. And so I'd ask for some grace um, for each other, not just our mental health teammates, right? But just for each other, um, provide a little grace to each other that we are trying the best that we can with what we've got in some of very challenging times. Um, take care of yourself, right? Um, and whatever that means to you, um, but take care of each other. Uh, I think kindness will go a really long way in today's world. And um, we could all use a little bit more kindness. And at the end of the day, um, know that at least uh, you've got a bunch of folks rooting for you and we're here to partner with you and so grateful uh, for the time, Chief. Like, yeah. you're pretty awesome. Thanks. <laughs> you too. Thank you very much to both of you. I know you have meetings to go to, I so. I go. <laughs> <laughs> you can stay with us, but. Oh, I want to. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, and these questions, Chief, I, I know they're coming in. So yep. um, if we want to do a part two, if we want to do, you know, question answer like yep. a frequently asked question like however we want to do it like we want to make sure people get their their questions answered so happy right. to support whatever way i'm going to make sure these get saved so we don't okay. lose anything and then and then we'll see what where we go from there okay perfect. thanks so much well, you both take care yeah likewise we miss you already bye-bye bye, -bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs>